All right, if, anybody, if everybody here would please take your seats. We're just about to begin. We're a little behind. I'm going to try to keep it on schedule. So thank you all for coming today. And this is the, the panel discussion. And we're going to be, I'd like to begin, I guess, first by, by introducing the panelists. Uh, first, we have Joe Cravoza, who is uh, an associate director for the Institute of Transportation uh, and uh, Energy Efficiency. Did I get that right? Close enough. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I copied it down wrong. But UC, anyway. UC Davis Energy Programs. UC Davis Energy Programs, and he's sure. former mayor. A uh, lovely fellow that I've known for years, and uh, he's a he's a former member of a father daughter book club that I was a part of. He's uh, he was on the Puda Creek Council and uh, probably still is, I guess I don't know. And, and uh, anyway, he's done a lot of wonderful things. Um, next we have not Matt. Yeah. Well, yeah, next we do. <laughs> we have Dong Zhao, and he is a Humphrey fellow from China, uh, and he is uh, in China. He works with a public. Uh, China Meteorological Administration, and I had to look up Humphrey Fellowship because I know it's pretty well known, but it's a, it's a fellowship um, that's been around since 1978, and it brings in mid-career leaders from developing countries to the United States um, uh, for a, a year of academic study um, or uh, work in, uh, to, achieve, to uh, get professional experience. And he's working right now with the UC Policy uh, Institute uh, of Energy uh, and en Environment and Economy. And uh, he's been here for about eight months, and I think it sounds like he's having a good, a yeah. good experience. Next, we have Emily Abdel Ghani, and she is a field organizer with the California Student Sustainability Coalition Solidarity Organizing Program. She's a formal fossil-free UC intern, and she's coordinated various uh, programs. She coordinated the 550-person uh, 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 convergence at UC Davis uh, Cross-Cultural Center, um, and she works at the intersection of social justice and environmental sustainability. And there's one other panel member. Oh, that's what it is. All right, is that better, everybody? One other panel member who's not here but will be joining us, okay? And that is um, Sarah Zargoza-Smith. She's from Davis High School. She, she had the wrong church that she went to this morning and she's being picked up right now. <laughs> so welcome her when she comes. Um, there, there, is, there is no wrong church. No. <laughs> Good. That's a very that's an excellent point, Joe. Thank you. So what we're going to begin with is we're going to have um, the, the panelists that are here are, are, are going to give a, um, a response to, the, um, to what we've just heard. And, and particularly, let me see if I can find this here. This is the, this is, this is the prompt that they're responding to. Kathleen Dean Moore believes that we have a moral obligation to take action to protect the future of, the, of a planet in peril. How do you view the climate crisis? And what are your ideas for effective climate action, including right here in our community and in this region? So why don't we begin with Joe? Very good. Thanks, Craig. I, I really think of Craig as... Uh, Katie Grace and Matt's dad, so uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, just a tremendous uh, talk by, by Kathleen, uh, weaving together you know, so, many, uh, so many wonderful uh, themes uh, to, to inspire all of us. Uh, I have a very good friend who's a social anthropologist, and he tells me that uh, everybody has something that's kind of at the top of their brain. Uh, when they're uh, going through their, their day. And it might be the relations with somebody else or a project that they're working on. And so I wanted to, was trying to think whether I'm on this panel because I'm the former mayor or because I work in the energy and transportation programs at UC Davis 
uh, or because I've done different things in the community. Uh, but listening to uh, Chris kick us off, I thought, you know, no, what I really am is what's churning around in my brain right now are, are how I'm going to finish the design dimensions on the new uh, three-stage uh, compost bin that I'm building uh, for the side of our house. Uh, in fact, I see Ed Clemens uh, back there, who's my counselor uh, in my compost bin project. So, uh, so I feel qualified here, uh, I think, why, for, that, for that main reason. Um, I'll also observe that those of you who've shared with me that uh, I'm the old guy on the intergenerational panel, um, <laughs> I, I, I just want to say uh, I didn't need to be reminded. Uh, I noticed that uh, immediately uh, upon uh, seeing the, the program as it's uh, presented here today. Uh, but here's what, here's what I wanted to uh, share a little bit. The, one of the questions was kind of how do we view uh, climate uh, change uh, and how do we respond to that? And I would say on an intergenerational uh, panel, uh, I will observe a couple of things. I really do think about climate as an intergenerational issue. I think about uh, how we are passing on, certainly, uh, our legacy in a wonderful planet, uh, one that we've enjoyed uh, to our children. And two things uh, come to me in that. One is that uh, the best studies show that $1 spent today on mitigating the impacts of climate change saves us at least $5 down the road. So if we're just trying to be fiscally responsible, uh, we want to put money in now, and it's going to have a benefit for us uh, later. The other is that uh, every uh, piece of carbon molecule, however, uh, that goes into the environment is going to be there for uh, 10,000 years plus. So this isn't something that we cast up into the environment and then it's going to eventually you know, blow away or find its way you know, into uh, the stratosphere and not affect us. Uh, what we do today matters uh, for a long, long time. Uh, so I want to talk about a theme, though, that, that really has been dominant in my brain uh, really since law school uh, here in Davis. And that is the, the, the idea of absolutes versus balancing. And when I was studying natural resources law, uh, you always saw these different constructs in government that were either an absolute, we were going to say we were going to protect this forest, period, or the construct would be one of balancing. Uh, where we'd look at, well, what is the effect going to be on jobs or the economy or the status quo versus change and so on. And, and that construct of absolutes versus balancing has come to always be present, as the social anthropologists would say, uh, really top of mind uh, for, for me. And climate change, to me, uh, is, the, is the absolute. There is no question about it. This is a standard that we must meet. The goal for California, at least through executive action, is we must reduce the carbon by 80% over 1990 levels by 2050. 80% over 1990 levels by 2050. If that number is wrong, it is wrong because 2050 should be 2040 or 2030. And everything I read in the paper tells me that we need to be moving that number sooner and sooner and sooner. So then I ask myself, applying this absolutes versus balancing, um, how does that affect me on a personal level? And how does that affect me in kind of a societal, uh, collective way? And so I try to set my own uh, absolutes. Uh, what are the things that I'm going to do in my daily life uh, that can, can represent me and my family and those close to me that I love uh, achieving that 80% reduction by, by 2050. And so, you know, I was, I was the bike mayor. We did the bike to AYSO. I think, you know, bike to your place of worship uh, is, a, is, a, is a great aspiration. Um, Lucas and I made common cause on one environmental issue after another. Uh, my friend Rob Davis uh, here in the audience who's going to be with us more this afternoon speaking, uh, really come to the city council with these ideas of always thinking on every decision uh, what we can do to move things uh, forward. So that's, that's kind of on the, a little bit on the personal level. I've, you know, I've, I'm an EV driver in addition to being a bike rider, and the latest goal has been to put solar, actually we put solar in 13 years ago, we just doubled our solar though, so that our solar can cover all of the household electricity 
uh, obviously with a renewable, but also um, our, our Nissan LEAF, which is a highly affordable, wonderful, wonderful vehicle. And uh, my last check after having the lease for 18 months was that we're putting 55% of all of our vehicle miles on the electric vehicle powered by solar, so you know, no carbon used whatsoever to power the car, uh, but still 45% on our kind of longer range vehicle, the, for the uh, Volvo station wagon. So I got, got a ways to go there um, to do it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the collective, though, um, and the collective, you know, we need to think about government, and I think we can't fool ourselves at all. Uh, at the national level, uh, we have gridlock in many, many areas, um, and we are not going to get a national climate policy that is going to start throwing big rocks uh, in the river uh, to start, uh, you know, a, a meander that we might all uh, desire. The Obama administration, um, let's be serious, at the US EPA is working toward carbon-based regulations uh, that are in the regulatory rulemaking phase uh, that can be very, very dramatic, and that makes a difference. You have a Congress that's not there, uh, but you have an administration that's trying to move this forward through US EPA. Second, he you know, just signed this wonderful agreement back in December in China. Uh, these are these 2030 accords, and the goal there is a 26 to 28% reduction in uh, carbon by 2025 and uh, with uh, President Xi of China. Really dramatic stuff on the administration side but not on the congressional side. At the state level we should all recognize that Jerry Brown and his agenda for the second term uh, is got climate uh, first and foremost. We have our zero emission vehicle standards, we have our efficient uh, vehicle standards for low carbon, we have our renewable portfolio standard which says 30% of all the power generated in the state by 2020 uh, should be uh, by renewables. Uh, we have our low carbon uh, fuel standard. So California is the number one sub-national jurisdiction uh, working forward. And then coming more local, Yolo County it was announced is now generating more renewable energy than Yolo County as the administration uh, is, uh, you know, needs. That is tremendous at the county level. And the city of Davis, as we know, has the, had the first uh, city in California to have the aspirational goal of uh, zero net carbon by 2050. So, so we're doing well, but I think we, what I wanted to, you know, encourage all of us to do is kind of think about uh, how we participate in the collective and how we participate in our own uh, individual lives. And uh, three things I'll say at the, at the close here. One is that um, integrate these climate solutions into everything you do. You know, it used to be that civil engineering was just this profession of building bridges and roads and so on. Now civil engineering is this wonderfully creative, integrative field of sustainability, you know, and that's very, very exciting. Uh, on a personal note also, you know, we're gonna have to make it fun. Uh, we're gonna have to make it enjoyable. Uh, we are human beings. We like interacting with other people. Uh, Kathleen's call to make this about love, uh, and she used the word fun, is, is absolutely right, uh, because we wake up in the morning and we want to do things that we like with people that we like. So find that space uh, where you're able to do that. And I just want to close by saying I'm an optimist, um, and I want to I point out something that I heard uh, uh, a week ago, and that is the Sierra Club has a campaign called uh, Beyond Oil. It started with a $300,000 grant that somebody gave the Sierra Club and said, try to do some stuff to get us off of oil. It is now, uh, I think, in the range of $50 million a year. It has 20, or has 150 permanent staff, and they have mapped every single carbon-producing plant in the United States, and they have a strategy for every single one of those plants to get it off. It's, it's staggering, and for some of them, it's because they're inefficient and there's a more cost-effective way to serve uh, the public. And others, it's because it's violating air quality standards and they can get them off, right? And, and others, it's just the values of the community that they're in should bring them down. So let's all have our own personal and collective beyond oil campaigns that we run, and let's make that top of mind uh, for us when we wake up and let's have fun and do it with love. Thank you, Joe. Uh, how about uh, 
we'll, we'll go with Dong now. OK. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so my, bank, my academic background is uh, climate change and uh, renewable energy. And because of this background, I always been uh, getting asked, do you really believe that climate change is true? My answer always that definitely I do believe. But for, I think for those who don't believe climate change, who will not take actions. But before uh, talking about my point of view about uh, uh, effective climate change actions, I will share, you, share with you uh, a story of my, or about my bicycle. <laughs> uh, as Humphrey Fellows always said that, your bicycle must be one of the most famous bicycles in the city of Davis, because I always start my story with it. That's true. <laughs> because that's really uh, some of my important ideas I come from this bicycle. I, come, I arrived at the United States last summer. And I know that Davis is famous for bicycling, and it is friendly for bicycle. So just uh, after uh, my arriving, I bought my bicycle. It is really very good. It is light, light and with high quality. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and at the beginning, I thought that this bicycle should be made in the U United States or in, uh, made in Germany, because I never see this brand in China. But one day I found out that this bicycle is made from China. <laughs> yeah, this made me to think about made in China. I want to find some more stories behind the label made in China. Then I had a small investigation just in uh, Humphrey Fellow groups because we all knew, we all fresh here, we, we need to buy a lot of things. The outcome was, uh, shocked me because most of the things we bought here are made in China. <laughs> yeah. So this then one idea, one of the most important idea jumped in my mind. That is everybody of Earth have a factory or have many factories in China. Because all these factories serve us with plant of high quality goods. But in the meanwhile, we should aware that these factories not only generate goods, they generate lots of greenhouse gas emissions. So, when mentioned about take actions, what should we do? Act, yeah, definitely, climate change is a global issue. Yes, because the atmosphere is boundless, right? But sometimes we only see this problem on the surface. Yeah, we, we may say that some countries have more greenhouse gas emissions, and some other countries have less emissions. So we blame, we criticize the country who have more emissions. But we always neg neglect that. Why this country have so, so many, so much emissions? So this is because of the globalization, not only because of the people in that country, so it's because all of us, because our con consumption, yes? So I think that climate change is really a crisis. Why a crisis? Crisis means that this problem is urgent and we have no 
enough time to deal with this problem, right? So what can we do? I think we have three ways in general. The first is, uh, no, before this, I want to talk something about uh, climate change, why it is urgent, why it is urgent. There is several reasons. The first is that climate change and air pollution is associated. This morning, one lady talked to me with, uh, talked with me about China. It's about smog. So the com combustion of the fossil energy will not only generate greenhouse gas emissions, they also generate a lot of air pollutant. Yes, this and many, many developing countries are experiencing serious air pollution events, the smoke, not only in China, but also in Pakistan, India, many countries, many developing countries. So we should take actions for as soon as possible because air pollution will do harm to our health. The second reason, there is something, something even worse because in the context of global warming, air pollution will be intensified by global warming because the global warming will reduce the wind speed mm -hmm. and also it will decrease the air convection which disperses the air pollutant. And the third, under the global warming context, the background, the extreme weather and climate change event will continue, continue to increase and we here, California, is experiencing extreme drought. Yeah, this, this may be the fourth year. And in the other side, on, uh, in the East Coast, Boston, this year they have experienced heavy snowfall. And just this, this winter, they may spend more than $35 million just to remove the snow. And totally to the whole country, more than $5 billion is worth shift off from the United States economy. So all these things give us a signal that climate change is urgent. It is a crisis. So what can we do? Three ways. The first is to reduce the energy consumption. There, there are many, many steps tips to reduce energy consumption. Yeah? When turn off your light when you don't need it. Unplug your charges yeah, when you don't, don't charge your cell phone or something. And even if possible, you can use the sunshine to dry your clothes. Don't use the dryer. But here, I, it is maybe not possible. But in China, we all, most of us use sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Many tips. And the second may be to increase energy efficiency. So every year, much of the energy are wasted, is wasted uh, because of the transmission, the heat loss, as well as the inefficient technology. So which is leading to increased carbon pollution? Yes. Energy efficiency is another effective way to combat climate change. So use energy efficient equipment, use electric car, or use small, use small car, not the big cars, and build uh, energy saving building. So the third is to develop energy, clean energy, so which is also very important. Wind power, solar power, hydropower, as well as biomass are all very important in the future. So in my country, we will increase the, uh, the, the, re the clean energy will be achieved 20% uh, in the, until the year to 2020, I think. We are working hard in, in this aspect. 
So the roadmap is very clear, but take action is really very, very difficult because people, it is very difficult for us to change our life, lifestyle. It is really very diff difficult. Even all of us place a high value in environment, but it is really difficult for us to change. So we, don't, we, we need many things to push our, for, uh, us forward. The first is technology, but technology is not enough. We also need innovative policy. So California holds the leadership in sustainable development because of your policy. So another important thing is public participate. So today this conference is a kind of activity of public uh, participate. It is really very, very important. So, and last I want to say that Climate change is a global issue, but to mitigate climate change, it is a local issue. And even, and we should deal with it locally, even personally. If everybody of us can take a record of our daily energy use, of our, our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, that would be great. Thank you. So finally, um, uh, Emily, um, what, do you, what do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, OK. Um, where to begin? I. I see climate change as a reflection of um, the current unjust systems that have been built up over the course of history. Um, I see the ramifications, um, the earthly response um, as a, a cry for help, um, that we need to change the way that we manage our, our resources, and resources are not just natural. They're not just what's beneath the surface of the earth. Um, we need to change the way that we treat each other and the way that our um, social systems are set up. Um, because right now, uh, the burdens and benefits of environmental harm um, are not equitably distributed because we do not live in an equitable world. Um, the access to sustainable technology um, or lifestyles or what have you is not going to be the same. And that's because we don't live in a world where everyone has the same opportunities. Um, and we, don't, we also don't live in a world where everyone needs the same opportunities. Um, a major sort of rub that I've found um, well, okay, I should do my background a little bit, or you heard. <laughs> um, I went to UC Davis, and um, I was really loved the bike culture, um, and I was inspired by the sustainability community, but um, the emphasis on individual lifestyle changes um, really didn't do it for me. Um, I really believe in collective action and that it's really great if you can adjust your lifestyle, but that's not going to change on the level that we need. Um, mostly because not everyone can do that. So um, I think it's incredibly important for us to focus on um, addressing the needs of communities um, rather than focus on what uh, each of us has like the privilege to do necessarily. Um, that's not exactly how I want to say it. Um, and also to be self-critical of, of our work um, and who we are uh, mobilizing with. Um, it's very easy to stay within your bubble, within your network, uh, to surround yourself with folks that think like you and look like you and live next to you and work with you, 
um, but it's not going to make the changes that we need to see um, if we stay within what's easy. Um, because this is a crisis, and it's much bigger than just environmental. Um, it's social, it's economic, it's interpersonal, it's on every level. Um, it's not just climate change either. Um, I'm not totally decided on whether or not I think climate change is the issue of our time. Um, I think that it's a heck of an important one and is a reflection of other issues. But um, if somebody decides that they don't want to spend the rest of their life working on climate issues and instead they want to work on race politics or gender equity, I'm not going to say that that's less valuable. I'm not going to say that that's uh, the, the, the lower road to go. Um, I think it's more important that we work together um, and value each other's work um, and tr strive to see the interconnections between our movements and to create those interconnected communities um, than it is to uh, try to mold everyone to the view of green or environmentalism. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can ask me questions later. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Before we, um, first of all, has Sarah come? Sarah? Not yet. All righty. Right. Uh, I heard that. Hard to find a church that's farther away. So um, I have a couple of questions before we turn to the audience. Um, and, I'm, and they're two questions, and so I don't mean to uh, uh, make this complicated, but I'm going to ask, uh, ask each of you this. We'll start out with Joe here. Since this is an intergenerational panel, Joe, what do you think that younger people have to offer the older generations in terms of fighting the fossil fuel industry, dealing with climate change, and um, by the same token, what do older people have to offer younger people in the same concerns? Well, I think, you know, I think younger, younger offering the older uh, is tremendous because the, the, the practices that the young set now, you know, really are those pebbles uh, and rocks in the river uh, that are going to change things. I mean, if you think where we were 20 years ago, we had a transportation monoculture that was internal combustion vehicles, period, you went to the gas station, you know, a paucity of public transit in the United States, and now, where are we? Well, we've got Lyft and Uber and you know, zip car uh, abound. We're, 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 we're shifting the whole investment in transportation infrastructure in California to increasingly, you know, fund bike lanes and, and uh, complete streets and so on. So I think the, the practices of the young now are going to reverberate and magnify in society going forward. I also want to talk about um, social media and electronics, uh, things that I just barely understand. But you know, when we first saw Lyft and Uber come, I thought, you know, big deal. We're going to save some money, no question. Some of us won't have to have a car because we'll use Lyft and Uber. Uh, we'll get a little more competition. But now Lyft has started this Lyft line service, right? So if you get Lyft and you do Lyft line, they'll find people along your line basically to set up carpooling uh, and shared rides. And so in San Francisco now, we're getting young people uh, spreading to the, the other generations, you know, signing up for a Lyft trip and along the way going a little bit out of the way, saving 40% of their money and getting to the end having met two or three different people in the car. You know, that's, that's new technology being used to reduce carbon, get cars off the road. Uh, older to younger, um, you know, I just think incredible encouragement to, um, to, to the young uh, to, to, to carry the mantle and to lead by example. I mean, those of us who have got a little more means and are a little more comfortable, you know, making sure that we, you know, get the electric car, get the bike repaired, put solar on the roofs, 
and start you know, seeding those industries that can provide jobs for the younger generations. Dong, could you answer that? And if you wouldn't mind giving us maybe a few insights about um, the, the interplay of the generations in China. Oh, OK. But in my mind, uh, there is not big difference between elder people and young people. But if you want to, uh, want me to find some difference, maybe for the young people, their responsibility is to develop high technology <laughs> to deal with this problem. And for the elder people, I think they, they, they are much more active in my mind because many activities related to climate change, they are there. They are active participants. So I think the elder people, may their role is to push the young people to deal with this problem together. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, how about you, uh, Emily? I'm just to tell you, I mean, when, when you're older, you realize you're, you're like the exception. You're always the young one, but, but go ahead. <laughs> what do you, how do you feel? Do you, do you feel that there's mentoring relationships? Or, you know, what, what do you, how, how do you view what the young have to offer the older generations and the older generations have to offer the younger in, in, this, in this? So I have to be honest, in my community, I feel like, I feel like the old person. Like, I feel like the, <laughs> like, seasoned, like, whatever. Um, like, I feel like I've, I'm tired a lot of the times. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but that might be a reflection of the fact that I, like, recently graduated from a, a college community, and so I was, like, a senior and, and often in the mentoring role. But, um, yeah, I have definitely, um, I, I have some really incredible mentors that um, are not afraid to challenge themselves, um, not afraid to uh, push past what they, um, they, basically, they haven't stopped growing. I think that's the most important part, mm -hmm. is that you, you can't stop challenging yourself and stop um, developing, like, um, your ability to see the world for how it really is and how it could be doesn't stop with age. Um, and it definitely doesn't uh, have to start at any point in your, it can start at any point in your life as well to begin to become um, self-critical and, criti self and critical of your work. Um, one thing that I do have to say is on the policy level, um, <laughs> California and United States and global policy is often shaped by older generations. Um, and it can be very frustrating and disempowering as a younger person to try to affect those, um, those policies when we're often met with um, criticism of our idealism or our naivety um, when, in fact, we're not really asking for that, that much, like, that two crazy of things, right? We're asking for simple things, like we should protect where we live, we should fight for the rights of people, we should um, have respect for one another. Um, being part of a community of, of, of youth climate leaders um, often looks like us holding older people accountable, because oftentimes older people have more power in certain spaces, um, either financially or politically. Um, just because California is seen as a leader doesn't mean that we're doing that great of a job as a leader. Um, it's bigger than carbon. It's, it's bigger than um, net zero anything. Because when you think about what the word net means, it means that you are putting something out there. You are wasting. You are extracting still. Um, that impact can't be mitigated completely. It just can't. Um, and if that's idealist, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really care. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. And I know you've already had an opportunity to speak, but Kathleen, could you? Would you mind uh, um, 
addressing the, this, this sort of intergenerational issue? What can one offer the other? And I wonder if you would call on me because I'm clearly the elder in this group. Joe, you are nowhere in time. <laughs> 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 Microphone. Oh, you need a mic. Here, let me. Um, you know, I, I, I want to. I want to add a comment to what Emily said. Is that right? And that. Uh, and, uh, oh, you got a mic now. But when I was a student leader, I thought I had great ideas. And I know in a number of instances, I did have great ideas. And the elder, the elders, the, 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 the generation ahead of me uh, didn't, didn't listen. I mean, really didn't listen. And I think we, we owe, uh, we have a tremendous obligation to our youth who have been going to high school and college and thinking and reading the newest texts, really to hear what they have to say. I mean, we read our newspapers, we get our information. But you know, students are really taking it in. And then I have to say, I have to confess, that when I was mayor and I was older, I had some kind of half-baked ideas, and people really listened to me <laughs> um, and, and did them. And, and I always thought, hold on, let, let's back up a little bit here. I wasn't that serious about that. So I think you know, we, we really owe it to, to the youth. And, and we have a great responsibility, I think, when we're older, because people are going to listen to us more to really make sure that we've got it right. So. And is your uh, microphone working there? Want to give it a tap? I trust it is. Oh, good. OK. Well, should we talk about the elders first? I mean, there, there is a tendency among people who have worked hard all their lives to think that now they come to their retirement, they can rest on their laurels and that the world owes them now because they've given so much. The opposite is true. We have come, I think, elders, to the peak of our ability to make change in the world. We have the one resource that the young people do not have, and that is time. Mm -hmm. And so as they're struggling to make their way in the world and as they're trying to do their best, um, they're overwhelmed with responsibilities. But we who have done that, and, and we really are able to bring our experience, to some extent our privilege, to some extent our wealth, and certainly our time to help in this process. And we owe it to, to our children and our grandchildren. So I, I wouldn't let any elder off the hook. Um, and in fact, I, I would celebrate the energy of the elders. I, I celebrate the, um, the courage of the elders and the open-mindedness and the ability to think beyond their own worlds. Um, I, I think it's just a terrific resource that, that um, I, I would like the uh, AARP journal to stop sending in you know, articles about, about gallbladders and start thinking about <laughs> bicycles. <laughs> so we must not allow ourselves to be wasted. That mocks death to waste a single moment. Young people, you've been professor for so many years and they continue to blow me away. They are outspoken and courageous in ways that we have been trained not to be. They have a global view. They think about justice in ways that we have been accustomed not to do. And they are truth tellers with a degree of courage that, and a degree of education that I think is, is, is a great gift to the world. And Emily is a beautiful example of that. She's not cutting any quarter, is she? I mean, she's calling us to account. And eloquently, I would say. So that, that's what I would say. But look who we have. Come. <laughs> so welcome. We're so happy Thank to. Thank you. <laughs> and I didn't get a chance to speak to you, and I have I don't have much of your biography here. I know you're a student at uh, Davis High School. That's true. Yeah. Um, my name is Sarah Zaragoza Smith. I'm a junior at Davis Senior High School, and I'm 16 years old. Right. I, you know, this is, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I guess you volunteered for that duty when you decided <laughs> you'd sit up here. What we've been talking about is uh, how the generations can interact on this issue of climate change. What do, what do the older generations have to offer the younger generations? And have they been offering it? And what do the younger generations have to offer the older generations? And, and, I would, and we would like very much to hear what you might think about that. OK. Um, so for me, global warming has, and climate change has been part of my life. I don't know a world without it. Um, but what's been really important to me is ever since I started going to school, I've been learning about it and learning how to help 
slow it down and how to make it better. We would watch videos when I was younger about the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. There's always been a wealth of knowledge that the older generation has been willing to give to me about what this is, what's been going on, and how we can try to stop it and try to change things and make them better. And that's been really important, I think, to my development and understanding of what really this is. But I think that sometimes people get lazy with it. <laughs> they, um, they forget to pay attention to it as often as they can, and I think that's what the younger generation can offer to the older generation. So you guys can all give us knowledge and we can remind you, hey, keep working at it. We're still gonna be here for a lot longer. We're gonna have children who are gonna be here for longer than that. Keep working at it. And I think that's what we can offer as well. well thank you very much. You know, we had, um, we'd, we'd, we'd talked about taking uh, questions from the audience, but it's just about uh, the end here. And I know that, that um, um, we want to keep this, this, this program on schedule. So I, I think we'll have to bring this uh, panel discussion to a conclusion. And um, if you could, um, I, I think we'd have a nice round of applause for these panelists and the time they spent. Okay.